You're watching Beyond Market. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us. On today's show, we'll discuss how technology can improve Nigeria's health outcomes. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Market, and you can follow my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awuni. Now, the U.S. Agency for International Development notes that health indicators in Nigeria are some of the worst in Africa, and the country has a fast-growing population estimated to reach 440 million people by the year 2050. Now, how can disruption in the health tech space improve Nigeria's health outcomes? Timmy Giwa Tubosan, founder, LifeBank, and Abasi Ene Obong, CEO, 54 Gene, join me now for today's discussion. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. Abasi, let's start with you and what uh, 54 Gene is about very briefly. Okay, so 54 Gene is an African genomics company and we're building the first Pan-African Biobank, uh, which is meant to help us understand uh, the disease profile of the various African countries and also help inform how diseases are treated, you know, and, and also uh, give us insight into what's going on in hospitals so that we can target the right drugs. Uh, diagnose the cancers the right way, target the right drugs, and use that data that we collect hmm. uh, from Africans to actually create new drugs. Okay, that, that's definitely a disruption in, in the health uh, space. Tammy, what's LifeBank? So quickly talk to us about LifeBank. LifeBank is a medical distribution company. Uh, we help hospital system find the critical supplies they need uh, to save their patients' life. Things like blood, uh, blood products, uh, plasma and platelets, um, and oxygen. Uh, okay. Basically critical supplies and emergencies that are required to save patients' life. Okay, now Abasi, when you first talk to us about how this idea first came about, were you trying to solve a need? Usually when we hear of this you know, very disruptive tech, uh, tech you know, solutions to problems, it's usually because you know, there's usually a story behind it. So what was the story? Okay, so the biggest need that we are solving is the fact that Africans make up only 2% of genetic research that has occurred globally. Now, why is that important? It's important because uh, the medicines of today and the medicines of tomorrow are what you call personalized or precision medicine that are actually made to treat people based on their genetic profile or you know, the, sub, the markers, the biomarkers that mm -hmm. they express in certain cancers. What this means is that most of that research that is leading to new drugs have not brought in the African population. And that means that in the next 5 to 10 to 15 years, the drugs that will be used will not treat you or I. Oh, or wow. anybody of African origin um, in the world. And so we started 54Gene as a way to contribute that African genetic data uh, to, to, to the centers where this research is being done so that we have that inclusion and we don't have situations where a diagnostic or a drug will come out and, and will have a disclaimer to not be used on people of African origin. And mind you, there are some drugs and diagnostics already that are already doing that. that, are already doing that. But what's even more interesting is the fact that the African genetic uh, uh, profile is varied. It's the most varied and diverse genetic uh, profile on Earth. Uh, and almost and every, every population on Earth immigrated out of Africa. What that means is that by studying the African genetic information, you can actually find natural mutations that have been put in various populations that help them uh, that provide protective, protective functions okay. for certain diseases and model that into new drugs. And guess what? There are two drugs currently in the market that were found as mutations in African populations. So, I mean, so how did this idea, going from an idea to actually putting the structure in place, talking to investors, and actually setting the ball rolling into what it is today, actually, you know, doing the research and making an impact? So, I mean, my background is genetics, and I've also worked uh, in the life science space for uh, consulting for management uh, for pharmaceutical okay. companies. So I knew that there was this need. However, I knew that in order to fulfill this need, I needed to have a lot of money, um, and I did not have that, right? So what do you do at that point? You distill and simplify till you can get uh, your idea to the lowest common denominator. And so we started as another product called Diagnose Me, uh, a way to provide diagnosis to people and uh, make it accessible, knowing that we could use that track record to then begin to talk to investors, right, and then be able to raise the money to pivot into this. And so even though we knew from the beginning that we're going to do this, we started with another idea 
right? Uh, it's similar to Facebook, right? So okay. Facebook today is does many things, but how did Facebook start? It started as a social platform for Harvard. Right, and so sometimes we have these huge dreams and ambitions, and I even have bigger ones, right, <laughs> for what we could be. Okay. But you have to be able to distill it into a simple form of something that you know that the resources you have can actually do. Mm. And so that was what we did. Mm. Okay, interesting. Tammy, for Life Bank, the service that you provide, I mean, at the end of the day, it can mean the difference between life and death. Talk to us about, I mean, how that idea was conceived conceived in the first place and how you were able to how that was able to how you were able to translate that into an actual service that is now impacting the health that is a blood bank space in Nigeria absolutely uh, so I discovered um, a problem a, a couple of years ago um, I've always had a passion around uh, maternal health care and I discovered that uh, something called postpartum hemorrhage now this problem has been around for many many years uh, but I, I found out about it uh, about five years ago and it's basically a mom you know, gives birth and within um, 20 minutes and two hours, she's dead. So you have something very positive happening, a beautiful thing, a creation of new life, and then a death, uh, very closely related to each other. Um, and postpartum hemorrhage is bleeding after birth. Uh, it's a really horrible problem. It's a problem, it's the largest cause of maternal death in the world. Um, and Likewise, is the largest cause of maternal death in Africa and in Nigeria as well. Uh, so I, I saw this problem and no one was working on it, so I thought I could try to solve it. Now when a mom is bleeding, uh, you need to stop the bleeding and transfuse and replace the blood she's lost. Um, and if you don't have blood available and she's still bleeding and you can't stop the bleeding, uh, she's gonna die. And it's really very simple, uh, but it's catastrophic and, and, and it's awful. Uh, so we thought that we could build a link and be, be the infrastructure that connects um, this busy hospital system where these moms are dying uh, with the healthcare, with the critical supplies they need uh, to save uh, the moms. Um, likewise, for oxygen, that we, we launched uh, a product called Airbank recently, oh, okay. um, and it's for oxygen. Now we, so I discovered again that uh, the largest cause of childhood mortality, particularly children between zero years old and five years old, uh, is is pneumonia. Right? And when a child gets pneumonia she, um, and they need medical oxygen uh, and they don't get access to that, they're going to die. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, again, the largest cause of childhood death in Nigeria. Uh, so we thought that building an oxygen trans uh, oxygen uh, distribution system uh, could really help solve those problems as well. So, but what's it been like? I mean, having that idea come to life, you're actually now making. Uh, in term, I'm talking about the challenges. Those uh, you know, bottlenecks that you had to, you know, pass through. I mean, working with the hospitals and actually building, because I imagine building those links mm -hmm. and ensuring that blood that you provide mm -hmm. is available mm -hmm. when needed. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that we wanted to be the infrastructure. Mm. Now, when you are infrastructure, you ha it's, uh, it's expensive to build infrastructure. Uh, we have to run a 24-7 operation. We are open 24-7. Since we launched Life Bank about four years ago, we've never shut down. Um, that requires massive amount of capital. It requires massive amount of passion to pull off. Uh, we have to deliver round the clock, uh, and we have to deliver in a short amount of time. When we launched, before we launched, uh, it could take up to 24 hours hours just to get the blood you need, um, even in Lagos. Um, by the time we launched uh, the first year, the delivery time was about three hours, and now it's 45 minutes. So we've done quite a lot of work in bringing uh, our delivery time down uh, significantly and saving lives um, across the city. Uh, the challenges, again, is you know, fund, fundraising, getting enough capital to actually become um, the, the, the distribution engine and the, the inf a required infrastructure for the yeah. healthcare system. That's a big challenge. And then getting the right team. I think, you know, yeah, <laughs> that's something. You can relate to Abbas. So, um, I'm happy you, you, you talked about capital. I'll come to you again. Uh, Abbas, let's talk about capital. I mean, you have this great idea and you know the kind of impact it could have and yeah. the kind of disruption it could cause. I mean, speaking, taking this idea to where the money is and yeah. you know, those who can provide the capital, what was that experience like? Um, so, so, for some reason, healthcare, the healthcare sector has been the last um, place where you would get investment. So typically mon money has flown to telecommunication, fintech, um, and it's only recently that health tech is beginning to, to bring in money. 
Um, in our experience, the investors we, we start talking to, the African investors, now we didn't talk to all African investors, so let me just put that out there. But the ones we spoke to uh, did not understand, or I don't know, maybe they didn't have the appetite for risk uh, that was involved uh, for healthcare. Now, in our. So it's perceived as high risk? <coughs> I think it's perceived as high risk, but it's also the fact that the, we haven't really had healthcare business in Africa. Okay. We've had hospitals, we've had pharmacies, right? And we've had distributors that send products to pharmacies and to hospitals and patients. And now we've had payers. But we haven't really filled out the gaps in the healthcare space. It's not an ecosystem yet. So these investors haven't, some of them haven't really seen what a thriving healthcare ecosystem looks like. And they don't understand the models that are used in other markets. So luckily, because I have had most of my work experience in the US, which has one of the best, well, most expensive, but also <laughs> best healthcare systems, um, you know, you get to see all the models. And so I was able to leverage my connections uh, and access there to raise funds and the investors there understood the concept. Now, on the other side of the world, they understand the market, but they don't understand, well, they understand the, the, the concept, the they understand uh, the product, but they don't fully understand the market, right? So that's, you have the, the people here understanding the market, the African market, but not the product. And on the other side, you have the people understanding the product, but not the African market. And so you have to tell stories. I think what made us successful was the power of storytelling. Um, being able to draft a narrative, understand what the various perspectives of, your st of, of the people you're going to meet are, okay. and being able to weave a story, a true story, but a story that answers their questions and can really take them from point A to point B to point C. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't, initially it wasn't an easy process to, to understand that. But I would say that as soon as we got that and we began our fundraising, we raised our, uh, our funds in three weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm, happy, I'm, I'm, I'm really <laughs> happy to hear that because, I mean, general makes, I mean, just looking at it, I mean, research in, in the African continent is quite poor. And obviously, this is a, a, a great opportunity. Tammy, we're going to talk about, I mean, capital for uh, Life Bank, but we're going to take a short break at this point and come back and pick up from where we left off. I've been speaking to Tammy Giwa Tuboson. She's the founder of Life Bank and Abasi N. Elbong, CEO. 54G. Welcome back to Beyond Markets. If you're just joining us, I've been speaking to Tammy Giwa Tuboson, founder of Life Bank, and Abasi Ene Obong, CEO of 54G. And we're discussing how technology can improve Nigeria's health outcomes. Thank you so much for your time so far. Uh, Tammy, let me continue with you on capital. What was it like for uh, Life Bank raising capital? It was quite difficult. Um, I think particularly because of the problem we're solving. Um, again, a lot of people understood healthcare as a lot of investors understand healthcare as patients and not uh, people who underst understand the systems. And we don't have quite a lot of uh, investors in, in, in Africa or in Nigeria who have built their business on health in, in the health sector. Uh, so they didn't have a, a good sense of even local health systems or the local health market. And, um, and there are lots, there aren't um, quite a lot of, um, um, because we have a lot of you know, one-man uh, hospital businesses, there are not a lot of you know, mer mergers and acquisition. So there are not a lot of enough um, pointers and signals that there's something within healthcare that could be a, a, a strong investment um, sector and a strong investment area uh, so it, it was really difficult to prove the case we I mean we started at the earlier stage of health tech and, and I think maybe some of the work we've done uh, has helped people yeah. forge in a little bit at least to understand that there is something mm -hmm. here um, so we had to just prove that there is something here um, and then a lot of people also were not comfortable with the fact that there's a business around blood um, oh, really? Right, yeah. A lot of people were not comfortable with that. So we had to show that we're distribution. We're not particularly a blood business. We're a distributor. Um, and that we're sort of bringing tech into the distribution sector and they're making it more efficient. And I think people got that. Uh, so it was challenging, but we had to be creative. Um, again, tell stories, tell a narrative. And um, was that, did that make a, a significant impact, telling those stories, getting people to know that, look, at the end of the day, we're saving lives, and this is why? Absolutely. Saving lives, um, telling the stories of a hospital system and how they run, uh, giving them sort of like a 
sort of pointing them, telling yeah. a story about how a traditional hospital would run and how the problem we're solving uh, is a huge problem within the health sector, within the hospital systems. No, I, um, I know it's quite interesting. Uh, uh, but let me ask you, it's quite interesting because many of the conversations I have with health uh, professionals, there's always that call for, look, we need more, we need the private sector to come into yeah. the healthcare space. We need more private capital. And here you have to do a lot of, and I mean, just listen to you guys, you had to do all this explain, explaining, you had to, you know, tell stories just to get people. So how do we get the private sector to come in? Because obviously government cannot do it alone. There's very limited funds right now. So one of the, the issues I find in the healthcare sector, at least in Nigeria, is that and this is not, again, to be controversial, but it's the fact that you have just medical doctors doing everything. So medical doctors running hospitals. Um, I mean, when you ask, do you have, the, the question then becomes, do you have hospital management uh, experience or education? Do you have a master's in business? You know, have you done anything outside of just learning, uh, you know, biology or medicine? Now, when you go study biology or medicine, you don't, nobody teaches you finance, nobody teaches you accounting, nobody teaches you strategy, nobody teaches you marketing, right? And so you've had uh, the healthcare industry closed off from most of the talent in the market, right? So I think that one of the things that would really help, and I know we're talking about having private sector money come inside. But even outside of that is having people experienced in other industries go into the healthcare sector. When I've worked in companies abroad, uh, in the US for instance, I've, I've seen people who've come in for, from, from consumer goods into pharmaceutical companies and as senior directors in those companies. Right? Um, they did not say it has to be a medical doctor. The biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world don't even have medical doctors as their CEOs. Most of their CEOs either have, say, a, an, M, an MBA and PhD dual degree, or sometimes even just a PhD, right? So it's really opening up that sector to the talent in the market, first of all. And then also money goes to where the talent is, right? Um, and so I think that, but that said, I will also say that uh, investors should have uh, more of an appetite for healthcare because it's a huge market when it's done right. But well, do you think that, uh, Tim, that this appetite could grow if we have more tech, you know, health tech uh, innovators you know, like, like you guys? Absolutely. I think we've opened the market in a, in a significant way. Um, and I think that we've shown that there is a business here. And I think the interesting thing about healthcare that's different from all the sectors, it's, it's absolutely a necessity. Um, when someone is sick, they need to get healthcare. And a lot of times they would find the uh, resources to make sure that they get the best healthcare. Uh, so I think for that, I think it's even it's significantly more de-risked than other sectors uh, within, within uh, 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 within our society, particularly in a society that is still uh, growing and developing. Uh, so I think that we've shown a little bit that there's a lot of investment space within healthcare. Um, I think that it's a sector that a lot of uh, venture capital, a lot of um, private equity mm -hmm. folks should be looking into in a significant way. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Well, would you say that, I mean, the African government or the Nigerian government uh, is nurturing its its young innovators, especially in the health, still in Europe, especially in the health space. Because I know that Kenya has set aside an innovation fund for emerging ideas among its youth. I'm just wondering, do we have that uh, in Nigeria? Or is that something that we should, we need urgently in Nigeria? I think we don't have that uh, generally. I mean, as, as, as far as I know, <laughs> we do not have that. Um, I think there's space for it, particularly in bringing uh, people with operational um, innovation uh, into even the government system. The reality is g the government runs most of the hospitals in Nigeria. That's a fact. Outside Lagos and Abuja and Potakot and Kano, they run almost 80% of all hospitals, right? So if you're going to transform health system, you're going to have to work with government. And there has to be some sort of appetite within the government. And so if you're um, bringing in technology into that mix mm -hmm. and it's still 80% government, Huh. Is that a problem? That's exactly. So you need government to be right. interested in operational efficiency, in, in research, in growth within that system so that you can transform the health, health sector. And when you bring operational efficiency into the government system, you're going to have increased uh, innovation. You're going to have increased employment. You're going to have better health outcomes for people. Uh, imagine that there is um, a 54 gene um, agency uh, or, or 
operations in, in all states in Nigeria, within all federal tertiary, tertiary institutions in Nigeria. Then you're going to see that the people, the Nigerian people, people who live in the states we don't talk about, um, are actually getting better services. They're having better health outcome. Same thing for legal. Uh, I mean, sorry, same, same thing for life bank. Okay. If you have a life bank in Zamfara, if you have a life bank in Taraba, if you have a life bank in Imo State, you're going to have all those people in those states will have better outcome because they're really going to government hospitals. But if you can make government hospitals more efficient, more efficient uh, yeah. you're going to have increased the world will be a better place. I People mean, uh, well, obviously, I'm just <laughs> well, getting that to happen. Well, that is a uh, well, that's that's uh, another story on its own. But uh, uh, Abasi, let, talk to us about how much innovation do you see out there in the health in the health uh, care space in, in Nigeria? Terms of, in Nigeria. So, um, I mean, Temi, she is, <laughs> she, is, she, is, she 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 paved the way for most of us. Um, and I mean, even with uh, the the air, uh, you know, the oxygen, yeah, the air bank. Uh, yeah. the air bank uh, just before she started Airbank, uh, one of my friends lost their family member in a hospital because there was no oxygen, you know. Um, and shortly after that, she launched Airbank. And I was like, wow, uh, that's innovation. <laughs> People yeah, don't have yeah. to die unnecessarily. African solutions you know, by Africans. By you know, Africans. We keep talking about that. You know, you have uh, MDAS, you know, a medical device as a service mm -hmm. uh, that just also raised about one million uh, mm -hmm. or so. And I well, like is it, is it would you say, is it, do you find it encouraging that I we're do. having these oh, yes. popping? Yeah. Okay. Because, you see, uh, previously, and this, again, this is not a criticism of, of people who came before, but previously, Health Tech was a group of people who say, we'll create an EMR platform and we'll sell it to one or two, three hospitals. And that was it. You know, um, it was just about building EMR uh, platforms. And in Nigeria now, there's so many EMR platforms, they don't even... They are not interoperable. They don't communicate with oh. each other. And so they were not really solving any problems other than maybe helping hospitals yeah, run more efficiently. Or so why do you think that was the case? Is it lack of mentorship? Is it lack of, uh, I think or it's, is it just money? Was I money think it's just also a talent. Okay. So the yeah. sort of people who, again, <laughs> the sort of people who did those, um, you know, and then when you compare them to the people who are doing what, uh, what is happening now, I think... It's more that you have people now who are more experienced, who have done things elsewhere, who have decided to come back and are bringing all that expertise and knowledge and access into the healthcare markets to actually create prob uh, to create solutions. solutions. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's it, it really has to do with uh, a new type of talent coming into the market. Are you hopeful for that? Absolutely, I, mean, kind of I completely agree. I think that. Um, there's so many other d different type of innovation. I think there was earlier when I started, I said I was tired of seeing either EMR systems or seeing um, doctor advice. You know, that was those were the two main things that people were talking about in health tech. Okay. Um, and I think what we have now is talent looking to innovate around the real problems, right? The real problems are operational. The real problems are research. The real problems are making sure that people have access to uh, diagnostic care uh, that MDAS is solving. Uh, and we are seeing a lot of talented people. I completely agree with that. Uh, entering, uh, looking at all the spaces within healthcare that's been neglected over time, um, and then transforming them, innovating them, yeah. and then making sure that capital is available. I was going to get really to that. that. I mean, going from that phase where okay, we've identified the talent and mm -hmm. the kind of problems, mm -hmm. you know, impactful problems. That it, that it can solve is it, would they meet with capital at the end of the day will capital be a, I mean you had you had a, a hard time convincing or maybe because it's you no know, had to do with genomics but are you comf are you optimistic that you know the more uh, talent this kind of talent that we see in the health uh, in the health tech space they would be able to get the, the required capital I'm hopeful yeah. you know um, I you know I'm hopeful because when you watch trends, money flows to where money is already or where money is going to. The more money goes into a certain sector, the more other people have confidence to put their money into that sector. So I'm, ho I'm hopeful that this is the beginning of like a renaissance for, for the healthcare industry. And one of the things I say is, I don't think it's even competition. I think it's collaboration. Okay. Collaboration is not a bad thing. Even competition is not a bad thing because we need to drive down prices of some diagnostic tests that are just ludicrous, right? And so I will even invite more people into this space. I'll say if you have uh, 
the passion, if you have the experience, uh, the expertise, come into the space, let's play together, let's get into that sandbox and build what could be the healthcare, uh, according to what Temi said earlier, right, Nigeria could actually be that place, the hub, yeah. that the hub, and it's possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have the people, we have the talents, we have the institution. Uh, what we need is the capital and the innovators uh, to really transform healthcare. And then you'll see that Nigeria has a chance to be the healthcare hub for sub Saharan Africa. Temi Abasi, thank you so much for your time on the show today. I appreciate you being here today. I've thank been you. speaking to Temi Giwa Tubosun. She's the founder of Life Bank and Abasi Ene Obong, CEO of 54 Gene. But that's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember that you can watch the show at 5 p.m. West African time daily and have access to all previous episodes of the show on our website at cnbcafrica.com. You can also stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets and you can follow my Twitter handle too. It's at Esther O. Awoni. For myself and the team, it's bye for now.